All right, so good morning all. Today we are going to be studying for our real estate pre-licensing class approved by the state of Connecticut, unit two, real property and the law, right? So when we have completed this unit, we should be able to discuss the concepts of land, right? Being able to um, understand home ownership rights, distinguish between real and personal property and the basic economic and physical characteristics of real property and discuss the limitations of the real estate professional under law. And there's quite a few key terms that we're going to learn as well. You know, we're gonna learn everything from accession to accretion, to air rights, to annexation, to appurtenance, to area preference, avulsion, chattel, emblements, erosion, fixture, in fact, who knows, this might even turn to be a two unit, um, to be a two unit section because I mean, there's a lot here. Littoral rights, personal property, prior appropriation, real property, riparian rights, severance, situs, subsurface rights, surface rights, trade fixtures, water rights. So when it comes to real property in the law, there is definitely quite a lot. So one of the things that I'm going to do right from the start is kind of share with you a little presentation that we have to help you get through it and to kind of understand what we're doing here, okay? So um, if we kind of look at this, you know, real property in the law, there's many types of property that define real estate's product, right? Real property and the lot. So land is one of those fundamental concepts, right? As well as improvements. So what might be an improvement, right? It could be a garage. It could be a, an addition. It could be a shed. It could be um, a paved road, a paved driveway, sidewalks, storm sewers, right? So we're going to kind of go through each one of them each one of those items, right? And talk about some of these things. So the first concept that we're going to talk about is land. Now we pretty much all think that we know what land is, right? But do we know when it comes to land that if we own a parcel of land, right? We own the earth's surface extending downward to the center of the earth and then upward to infinity, right? And so here is the diagram that kind of shows you all the way down to the center. So no matter what, right? When you own this parcel, you actually do own and can lease the air rights. Now, remember, there is such a thing called police powers, right? And so when we talk about police powers, right, we have, for example, the FAA. So you can't say, well, you know what, Rob Rosa said that I own up into um, infinity, right, up to a fit infinity to space, right? And so I don't want any planes flying over my house because the government's going to tell you, yeah, right, we'll fly over a plane over your house if we want to, because they have that right to be able to do that, right? somehow they got that right okay so but you are able to buy or sell which is pretty interesting which i think is pretty cool your air rights your surface rights right and even your subsurface rights like you know maybe you have some gold maybe you have some silver in there who knows now in a lot of towns especially that i know of in in connecticut they might even have some um zoning ordinances that you can't mine or that you don't own the subsurface rights unless you get permission. But it really kind of just depends on the situation and the town that you're in. Okay. Are there any questions about land? Okay. Well, the next question that I have for you is would you rather own real estate or real property? Anybody, anybody want to answer that question? Would you rather own real estate or real property? What do you like, Adam? Oh, real estate. You want real estate. Anybody else? Okay. Well, let's talk about the differences of real estate 
versus real property. Now, real estate is the land plus the human-made additions, the house, the, um, the garage, the driveway, right? Maybe the little shed in the back. That's real estate. But real property is real estate plus the bundle of legal rights. Well, what does that mean? Well, technically, think about it this way. Now, this doesn't happen very often, but remember, it kind of could. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy transactions that happen. What if I tell you, hey, I'm going to sell you this big, beautiful mansion. Let's just say this is like a 10,000 square foot home, right? And, you know, it has a three-car garage, has a pool, has a cinema, has all these great things. But I tell you, all right, I'm going to sell you this for $100,000. It's really worth a million, right? But I'm going to sell this to you for $100,000. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm going to sell it for $100,000. But guess what? Every other Friday night, I like to have a pizza party at the pool, right? And then on the holidays, of course, I got to have my family over at the house. Um, and then I will be um, utilizing the house you know, for July and August every summer, you know, and the story can go on and on and on because guess what you don't have for real estate, you don't have what? The bundle of legal rights. And that's what it really people want, right? People want the real property, the, the benefits, the rights that are included with the ownership of the land, Right? Isn't that what people really want? That's why pe some people say, well, I don't want to have an apartment because of this, this, and this. I want to have my own thing with a bunch of land and being able to do what I want to do there, right? And be able to give it to my children if I want to and stop people from bothering me if I want to. You see, that's part of the bundle of legal rights. So technically, you know, in my opinion, but, you know, not everybody listens to Rob Rosa, you know, in my opinion, we should be called real property agents, not real estate agents. And we should be buying real property, not real estate. Right? Anybody have any questions on that? So let's talk about, right, the bundle of legal rights, right? So there's actually five um, legal rights when we talk about this right, that many states will refer to. And, you know, we're talking, we're referring to both the physical property and the rights of ownership. So here's kind of traditionally the bundle of legal rights. So the first one is possession. I think that word kind of makes sense to everybody. Like, you know that, okay, you know, you have your toothbrush there. You have your favorite pair of jeans there. You have your um, shoes there. You, you sleep there. You possess the property. Okay. The next one is control. So that you have the right to control the property, but with, uh, with how? Within the law. See, that's important, of course, as well. It's not like you can say, well, I can do, I own this property. I can do whatever I want. So if I want to burn it down, I'll burn it down. Well, you can't say that, even though you do control the property, because it would be against the law for you to burn down unless you get a permit, you know, and especially if you have a, a mortgage on the property, you'd have a big time issue. Okay. But possession, control, enjoyment right? So that you can use the property any way you want to, of course, within the law. But you can use, you have use of the property to enjoy it, right? And like I said, do you want me to sell you this property where I'm going to be there every weekend? And you're going to, you're going to be like, what the heck is going on here? I thought I own this property. Yeah, but not if you don't have the bundle of legal rights right? Or, you know, let's just say, for instance, you own a timeshare. Well, the use might be, okay, the 24th week of every um, year, right? The 24th week, that might be your use, but that's, you know, part of your bundle of legal rights, okay? 
exclusion. Well, what does that mean? That you can um, keep others from entering or using the property if you want to keep others away. Does that make sense? Right, that you're going to be able to um, keep others from entering or using the property. And then, of course, is disposition. So who knows this, this um, one of these legal rights, what does disposition mean? Anyone know? What's disposition mean? Well, think of the word dispose, right? That you can do what? You can sell it if you want to. You can will it if you want to. You can transfer it to those that you want to and so forth. And that you're going to be able to um, give the property to who you want to. Okay. So you need to know, I can promise you that this will probably be on the state exam. Possession, control, enjoyment, exclusive disposition. And what are they going to say on the state exam? All of the following are characteristics of the bundle of legal rights except. And they're going to put some word in there that you don't know. So you need to know possession, control, enjoyment, exclusion, and disposition. Now, the reason why we have this um, bundle of sticks, right, is they say that that came from the Middle Ages, where, you know, basically the seller transferred the property by giving the purchaser, the buyer, a handful of earth, like a bunch of soil or dirt, or a bundle of bound sticks from a tree on the property. And then after accepting the bundle of sticks, the purchaser became the owner of the, tree, of, um, the property from which the tree came. So does that make sense? Anybody have questions on that? Pretty interesting, right? All right. Go Moving on to the next um, section is talking about the word title, right? So when we talk about title to property, a lot of times, you know, we might get ourselves confused. And so, well, what does that mean? Well, you might, I can ask you this question very straightforwardly. Hey, do you get a certificate of title for your property here in Connecticut? And the answer straight up is no. Is there a piece of paper that's the title to your property? And the answer is no. In fact, does anybody know what's the name of the piece of paper that um, shows that's part of showing evidence of ownership? The deed. The deed, right? Now you might be like, well, Rob, that's not true because you know I got my Escalade right here and I got a certificate of title, right? Or I got my motorcycle or my camper, right? Well, you see those things are personal property. But when we talk about real property, we do not have a title, we have a deed. Title is a concept, right? Basically title, has two meanings, the right to or ownership of the property, including the owner's bundle of legal rights. So the right to ownership. And number two, the evidence of that ownership by a deed, right? By a deed. So that's why, you know, we do not have a, a piece of paper. That's kind of like, a, again, it's a concept, a concept it refers to ownership of the property, not to a printed document, okay? Gets a little bit tricky. Um, you know, kind of moving forward and, and it, we're kind of go back and forth on a few different things in this unit, but talking about, again, those real property rights. So I think we talked a little bit already about surface rights, right? That, you know, of course, when we talk about people having real property rights, you own the surface, right? But like we said, you also have opportunities to possibly own subsurface rights in certain areas, right? And in, you know, some of those states where they produce oil, you know, this could be like a really big thing where maybe even the land is transferred without including the rights to the minerals, right? I mean, it could even be happening here. We don't know unless you read the deed. 
right? And of course, one of the things that they do want to tell you, because many people are environmentally, um, you know, they 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 follow things and they have an issue, right, with what's called fracking when it comes to subsurface rights, right? Where basically um, they have a natural gas that's that is found in like kind of this rock shale rock they call it right beneath the surface and it's removed that natural gas is removed by what's called hydraulic fracking and um, they say that it has resulted in a lot of environmental concerns so you might need to know a little bit about fracking and some people think it's you know a really big deal that it hurts the environment and some people not so much um, so it's totally up to you to kind of think about that and talk about that all right, ear rights, like we, we say, that can be a pretty important part of um, real estate, right? Especially where in some of these large cities, you know, where there's um, skyscrapers and so forth. In fact, years and years ago, and this is, you know, this is, I think, when I first started real estate over 20 years ago, I was watching TV and someone, you know, it was like one of those discovery history stations. I don't know. Um, they were doing a show about real estate and, you know, some of the interesting things in real estate. So in Hong Kong at the time, there were two I forget if they were like, let's just say they were about 10 stories high, two skyscrapers, about 10 stories high, or two buildings, I guess you'd call them, because they're only about 10 stories. And someone, I guess, had owned this land here in the middle. So this is called a real estate play, right? A real estate play, P-L-A-Y. Somebody created an LLC. They bought this this alleyway. Now, this alleyway was only big enough for about um, a lobby and um, a couple stairways and a, an elevator or two. I forget exactly. Then these the same company, but what they did is they created another LLC or a separate company, and they asked this skyscraper or this building owner to buy their air rights. This building owner didn't know exactly why, um, but they sold the air rights. Then the same company went to this building over here, created another, you know, shell company, LLC, whatever it was. And so the, all three parties, they didn't know they were all being worked or played by the same company. They bought the air rights here. And then once the, so once this company bought the alleyway, the air rights for each one of these buildings, they then, believe it or not, they got the permits and the acceptance to build a building like this. So there's a building like that in Hong Kong. And I guess in this lobby area, it just has enough for like two, um, you know, um, two or emergency stairs and two elevators. And then this is all offices. Isn't that kind of wild? I know my pictures are not so good, but that's how important um, air rights could be, right? In fact, in today's world, they say in a lot of metropolitan areas, it's becoming an issue where there's some people that they never see the light of day because they're always walking in these areas where they're not getting any natural sunlight, okay? The next section is all about the wonderful world of water rights. So when we talk about water rights, right, what we're basically talking about is being able to, um, number one, being able to utilize that water, okay? So that's a big issue. What are your rights, you know, thinking about these things, what is technically your rights when you want to maybe either divert, you know, like let's say the, the, you got a brook or stream going through your house instead of it going that way, you want it to go this way, so you divert it or being able to use, right, some of the water. Maybe you have um, crops, you have a farm, right? Maybe you want to dam it, dam the water. You know, what are your water rights? What are your rights um, concerning those things? Well, first off, there's what's called the doctrine 
of prior appropriation. Doctrine of prior appropriation. And what that is saying, okay, and the, again, can this be on your state exam? Yes, definitely. What this is saying is that the right to use the water, divert the water, dam the water, um, that right has to be given to you by the state. It's controlled by the state rather than by the landowner adjacent to that water, okay? Because even if the water might go through your land, okay, you might be hurting the people that are downstream. So does that make sense to everyone? Anybody have any questions on that? Now, at the same, at the same part of that, when we think about water rights, we need to know that there's a difference between commercially navigable and not commercially navigable. So what does that mean? Right. Well, let's talk about the first one. The first one is called riparian rights. Right. Riparian rights. And when we talk about riparian rights, we're talking about um, the, the rights to the owners of the land along the course of a river or a stream or a flowing body of water. So remember, riparian, R-I, riparian rights. And there's technically two ways in which it is looked at. The first one is a non-navigable waterway. So let's just say, for example, okay, here's the, you know, if we, if we were to dice the river in half, you know, here's the river, there's the water. That's the river, okay? I know this doesn't look the greatest. And maybe you own a house over on this side. Maybe there's another house over on this side. Okay, that's the river. Now let's think of like a river or stream that's maybe in your town where let's just say a real boat that has um, peak passengers on it really can't go on it. You know, it's not like they're going to be able to um, do the... Hello, is everyone still there? Hello, yes, is everyone still here? Oh, good. So I, I don't know, all of a sudden, for some reason, my, my uh, computer went down. So it's not like they're going to be able to have, uh, you know, the, the riverboat cruise, right? It's maybe you can do it with a kayak or a little rowboat, maybe even a little, little boat, but it's not really, you know, for commercial passenger use. Okay, so if that's the case, that it's not really for commercial passenger use, right, you would own, if you're this house here, you would own to like the middle, you know, I, I should have done this a little bit different here, you would own to like the middle of the river, and then this house owns to the middle of the river, okay, that's for non-navigable streams or bodies of water that's flowing. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, let's just, so you see that's one part of the right pair and rights for, an, and the, again, just as a remembrance, this is for non-navigable, N-A-V-I-G-A-B-L-E, non-navigable. Now, let's just say here we are, it's navigable. So like, you know, you could, if you wanted to, you could have a boat and you can have people on there and you could be having like, uh, you know, the booze cruise and all that good stuff. And around here in Connecticut, that might be the only two that I know of that I think you can do that type of thing is the, the Connecticut River and the Thames River or the Thames, I think some people would say it over like from New London area right? The Connecticut River or the Thames River. Those are bigger riv rivers. Those are commercially navigable. So if you owned a house, let's say along the river that way on a commercially 
navigable river, commercial, navigable, okay? Well, you would own what? Till the edge of the water. You own to the edge of the water. You see the difference? Non-commercial, non-commercially navigable or non-navigable, you own to the center. But if it's commercially navigable, you own to the edge of the water. Okay. And does anybody know who technically owns the, the, the um, land under the river? Anybody got an idea? Well, the land over the river is technically owned by the public, right? Or the state of Connecticut. And believe it or not, um, it's part of the highway system. In many, in many states, those rivers will be part of the highway system. How cool is that? So does anybody have any questions about riparian rights? Any at all? All right, well, let's talk about, um, we talked about, remember, riparian, I'm gonna erase this. We talked about, that's like a river stream flowing bodies of water. Well, the next one for water is going to be um, what kind of rights? Well, for oceans, right? Or for lakes, um, people who border maybe oceans, lakes, seas, those are called littoral, L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L, littoral rights. Okay, littoral rights. And that's again for like oceans, and lakes. Now, if you have a house that here's the ocean, right? And you border the ocean, okay? Well, what do you own up to? What do you own up to? Anybody know? You basically own the land adjacent to the water. So you own this land adjacent to the water up to the average high water mark. Average high water mark. So does that make sense to everyone? Anyone have any questions on that? And they basically say that in some states, these riparian and littoral rights um, that basically um, are a pertinent, right? Well, what is that? A pertinent means that they run with the land. So they usually go like this land here from owner to owner to owner, like most of the time, unless something weird happens, right? You can't say, well, I'm going to sell you the house, but I'm going to keep the rights to the land. Most of the time, you cannot do that. I had a question. Yes, go ahead, Adam. Uh, how would they figure out where the high water mark would be? Is that like uh, wherever high tide would be usually? Or? Yeah, I think that's where they go. And, you know, usually you can tell. I mean, it's kind of the same for years and years and years. So they probably even have that in the deed. Somehow they probably have it written, you know, from the southwest corner of the house out 32 feet or something like that. So they will have somewhere in the deed or the town records, the exact feet from the house that you own. Um, and they, you know, they probably have just used like that average high water mark after so many, so many years. It makes sense? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. No, no problem. What else? Anybody else have any questions? Okay. So, you know, kind of staying with this whole thing about water and land, you know, we're going to stay on this page for another couple of minutes. Um, there's going to be a couple other terms that you need to know. And so one of them is called accretion. And does anybody know what is accretion? I'm just going to give myself a little bit of room here. Accretion A, 
C-C-R-E-T-I-O-N, or it's accretion, right? The increase, increase in land, right? From depositing um, of soil by the water. So like if you think about, you know, the Mississippi River flowing down until it hits, so you know, New London area, I mean, um, New Orleans area. Well, you know, all that silt, it's coming down. And then they'll tell you, you know, I don't know if it's, I don't really know the numbers, but let's just say, oh, New Orleans, if they didn't dredge it or if they didn't um, plow it or whatever they do, that it would get an inch of land every three years, right? Just making it up. So that's like the slow increase of land resulting from the deposit of soil of this flowing water. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's accretion, right? Then the other term that we need to know, which you've probably all heard of is what? Erosion. Does anybody have a question about what erosion is? right? That's the slow, right? The slow and gradual wearing away. Like think about the Grand Canyon, right? It could take hundreds of years or thousands of years for somebody to really notice, right? Where, um, you know, the water just keeps eroding away at the land, eroding away at the land, and you keep getting less and less land, okay? And the, the last one here is avulsion. So that sounds pretty rough, right? Avulsion. Well, avulsion is the sudden removal of land. So it could be what? It could be an earthquake, a mudslide that all of a sudden, boom, you go outside and you got no backyard all of a sudden because of a, a huge rainstorm or something and it, all this water, whatever it is, just came down and took away everything. And now you have no, you know, you just lost like your backyard. Okay. Make sense? Any questions on these water rights, different types of um, real property rights and different things that can happen? Okay, so there was a lot on that slide, a lot of definitely a lot of things that you definitely need to know. Um, you know, one of the things that kind of even comes into play is that whole thing about the coastal waters and making sure that you understand that, uh, you know, they have like, for instance, the law of the sea, they talk a little bit about that in your book, and understanding that um, the law of the sea recognizes that there's economic zones. So like, if this is the coast, you know, this is the coast, here's Florida, and here's Maine up here, right? You know, they say that up to 200 miles from the coast, that's like, you know, considered to be um, the exclusive economic zone, right? And then that's up to 200 um, nautical miles, 200 nautical miles. And then after that is the um, international seas. Kind of interesting stuff, right? Talks a little bit about that stuff. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit more when it comes to real property and the law. Let's talk about things that don't fit into real property. Now, a lot of people like to try to make things easy for themselves and start saying, well, you know, if it's not attached, it's not, it doesn't belong to the property. Well, I mean, that's kind of an easy thing to say but it's really not it's really not exact because all there's not all property that fits into that exact definition so you know personal property also sometimes called personal t personal t right um, basically it might not fit into the thing of you know that whole definition about being real property Right. And we know that real property is usually transferred by the deed. You know, it's part of the property. You know, it had it maybe it could be the stones from the patio. Maybe it could be the wood um, that's on the deck, right? That's real property. Maybe it's the trees that's on the property, the lawn, 
the, the grass that's on the property. While personal property is usually transferred by a bill of sale. So like for instance, here you are, um, you know, and this sometimes gets a little bit tricky, but you want to buy the lawnmower. Well, technically that's a separate sale and it should not be included in the sale of the home. Otherwise, in many cases, you're going to have a problem with the lender. Okay. Some of these items like personal property might even be called chattels. C-H-A-T-T-E-L-S, chattels right? And those might be things like chairs or tables or money, bonds, bank accounts, all that kind of stuff is considered personal property. Okay. Now we do have this um, term called manufactured housing. Okay. When we talk about manufactured housing, you know, really what we're talking about is um, back in the day, which they don't say it anymore, maybe the term mobile home used to be used a lot right, where basically the dwelling or the house was, was not constructed at the site, you know, it was built off site, maybe it was, um, you know, built in a, um, a warehouse, right, and then they installed it or assembled it on the property, right, and so there's a lot of different codes that come, you know, state and local building codes that might regulate the construction of it and how it has to be installed. And sometimes people, they might think it's a great idea for them, but then they find out that, you know, this manufactured housing or this, um, this mobile home, or it could even be a modular home, um, but sometimes it has to be um, brought to a, a mobile home park. And that mobile home parks are sometimes getting to be really pretty expensive. I mean, there's mobile home parks that are like five, seven, a thousand dollars a month, 500, 700, a thousand dollars a month without a problem, right? And what also comes into play here is um, also modular housing. Now, modular housing, they say it's pretty interesting because they actually say, you know, and some builders, they don't like this because they don't think, believe that it's true you know, compared to stick built homes, they say modular homes are built stronger because they don't get ruined in the environment while they're being built, right? And that there's many more quality um, controls in place, right? But we have to be as real estate agents, you know, as real estate professionals, right? We're supposed to be somewhat um, familiar with maybe the different laws. We're supposed to be familiar with maybe the different mobile home parks or manufactured housing parks. Familiar with if we see a house that's modular housing, it doesn't mean maybe that it's better or worse, but it is different, right? It is different. And so, you know, we should be able to disclose that to people if they ask us. Make sense to everyone? Everyone have, anyone have any questions on that? All right, well, let's talk a little bit about plants, right? So when we talk about plants, there's basically two classes, okay? The first class is kind of like um, things that we have to think about that don't require us to plant every year that are not part of, um, you know, they just come up naturally every year. Like for instance, when we talk about plants, right? We have what's called fructus. See, you're even learning Latin, you know, you guys are even learning, learning different languages like Latin in this class. And I'm not even charging you extra. Isn't that incredible? Are you psyched about this or what? Right? Fructus naturalis. So nature, I mean, nature, natural, right? We're talking about trees. We're talking about shrubs. We're talking about grass. Pretty simple and easy. Okay. Then we also have what? Fructus industrialis. Right? Fructus industrial is 
less, All right? So think about the word industry. You see the first one was nature, natural, trees, shrubs, grass. Well, think about industry. Well, what do you do with industry, right? You make money. And well, what kind of property makes money is things like crops, like crops, orchards, farms, businesses, industry. And those are considered to be personal property, right? The fructus naturalis is considered in most cases to be real property. Does that make sense? So you see fructus naturalis is considered to be, for the most part, trees, shrubs, grass, that's considered to be real property. Fructus industrialis, which might be like crops, orchards, farms, that's considered to be personal property, right? Most of the time, um, most of the, of the time you're not expecting um, them to be sold separately, but they can be, right? Or sometimes you might see, oh my gosh, I can't believe I can get these hundred acres of land for some incredible price, right? And then come to find out, oh, it doesn't include the orchards or the farms or the crops on top of the, um, the property, right? So you might be like, oh, wow. So I'm buying the land, but um, they have a 10-year lease with a farmer who's the one who has to sell that stuff, okay? So does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions on that? Well, let's talk about the different terms, right? The different terms that come also with plants, right? And we can talk a little bit about these, okay? So the first one um, is called severance. Now the word severance is to sever, is to what? Cut something. So when we when we're when we're talking about severance, we're saying, okay, we're going to take something that's um, real property, right? And we're going to make it into personal property. Well, does anybody have an example of that? Right? So maybe it could be, okay, well, you know what? Believe it or not, this rose bush right? This rose bush is real property. You know, any reasonable person might believe that it's going to stay when the property gets sold. But maybe on the inclusion exclusion list, when someone's selling a property, they put that they're going to take the rose bush with them be, um, because their daughter gave it to them for Mother's Day. And so they're going to cut it before they sell the property, turning it into personal property, severance. So that's a term that you need to know. Okay, the next term that you need to know is annexation. Anybody know what's annexation? A-N-N-E-X-A-T-I-O-N, -N -N -E right? So that's basically changing something from personal property to what? To real property. Okay, well, what might be example? Maybe you decide that you want to put a new patio up on your house this spring. And you're and so now you go to a store, a construction, you know, joint and you um, fill up your truck with um, pavers and gravel and sand. Right now, all that stuff that you just bought from the store right up even to when you get into your driveway is considered to be personal property. Right. So if God forbid, let's just say on the way between the 
between the landscaping place in your house, you stopped for ice cream and somebody stole all those pavers out of your truck when you were eating your ice cream Sunday, right? Well, you're not going to be able to call up your, um, maybe, you, you know, depending on the scenario, you're not going to be able to call up your homeowner's insurance company and be like, hey, they stole these out of my truck and I was going to make a patio out of them. So I want to make a claim with my homeowner's insurance. You see, that won't work because at that point, it's still personal property. But now once you go home and you lay down the pavers and you put the sand in there and all that good stuff and you mix it together and you and all that good stuff, then you're turning it to real property. So you need to know about severance. You need to know about annexation. And then lastly which I don't know why it doesn't all go together, really simple and easy. Um, you need to know about the word emblements. Emblements are what, as a reminder? They are those crops or orchards or vegetables. They are part of, or it's another word for the fructus, industrialist industrial les okay so emblems all right so there was a lot there there we talked about emblems we talked about severance we talked about annexation right um anybody have any questions before we move on to fixtures Any points or questions that come to your mind that you might want to discuss? All right, well, let's talk about fixtures, what they are, and then the classification, okay? So basically, a fixture is personal property that has been attached to the land or the building, and it becomes part of the real property. So if we think about fixtures, we're talking about simple things in my opinion, like your water faucets, right? Your heating systems, your radiators, your kitchen cabinets, your lighting fixtures, your plumbing. You know, it's basically being put in there to be, you know, uh, turned, you know, uh, an item. How would I, how would I write this? Item um, to be part of the real property. You know, it was basically personal property that was turned to be part of the real property. So again, think of like the me mechanicals, the hot water heater, right? Would it be the kitchen table and the chairs? No, right? That's not really attached and that wasn't meant to stay forever. You know, like a boiler system like my um, radiators, like my baseboard heating, like my storm door. I mean, think about it. You went to a store, you went to, you know, I hate to name names, but Lowe's or Home Depot. You bought a storm door, you came home and you nailed or screwed it onto the home. That's a fixture. Now it's part of the real property. Okay. Any questions on fixtures? Now, when it comes to fixtures, I don't know how, how come they wrote it on here, but what I want you to know is, let's just say, you know, do you believe, which I'm sure you will agree, that when people buy properties, sometimes there's a disagreement. Oh, I thought that was going to stay. You know, like, for instance, I had this one house that we looked at, and I could tell you right from the start that... Um, you know, let's do a stop share for a few minutes. I could tell you right from the start that, I mean, we walked into this beautiful kitchen and it was a big kitchen and in the middle was an island. And this island was gorgeous. I mean, it just it had extra trim molding on it, but the um, had some cabinets on it that looked exactly like the cabinets that were in the rest of the kitchen. It had granite um, countertop with like a two level granite countertop that looked exactly like the granite countertop in the rest of the kitchen. 
right? And so my buyers loved the home. And I mean, it was like a 400 and something thousand dollar home. And um, I get to my, they say they want to make an offer. So I get to my office and I pull in, pull in the disclosures. And what do I see on the disclosures on the inclusion exclusion sheet? That the island is not included. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You would never believe by looking at it that the island would not be included. So I called up the listing agent. Hey, what's going on? Is the island include? The island's not included. Oh, no, they found another home that they love and they want to take that with them. And, you know, I went to tell, I told my buyers and they said, forget about making the offer because, you know, why would that not be included? But sometimes there's weird things that happen. So you have to make sure that you are reading the disclosures. But sometimes people will not be very, very clear in the disclosures. And so that's why we have what we call the legal tests, T-E-S-T-S, of a fixture. So let's talk a little bit more about that. In fact, I'm gonna use a little whiteboard here. Right, and let me clear this out. All right, and we're gonna use, um, let's see here, some text, we're gonna use blue, okay? So let's talk about Maria. Well, who knows what Maria is, right? Well, we're gonna talk about the legal tests of a fixture. So, well, what does that really mean? Let's just picture in our minds that we have a buyer and seller who um, had a real estate transaction. And with this real estate transaction, um, the buyer and seller have an argument, right? And so now the buyer says, well, I thought that was gonna stay. And the seller says, no, that's not gonna stay. And so now here we are in, in court. And of course, you know, not every court decision is gonna go exactly by this. But this is generally speaking what usually happens, right? When we talk about um, sellers and buyers, and that's why it's important for us as real estate agents to try to make things as clear as possible. So the legal tests of a fixture, right? And the acronym that we're gonna use to help us remember the five basic um, tests is going to be Maria. All right, so number one, M, okay? The method of annexation. Well, what does that mean? You know, basically, how was it attached? How permanent, right, was the method of annexation, of attachment? So like, for instance, um, can the item be removed easily without damaging anything else? Can it just be wheeled out, right? Can it just be unscrewed really quick and easy? Or, or if it was taken away, will it, would it re, um, would it kind of um, damage the property? So if removed, this item, would it damage the property? Would it cause damage? Right, so that's the method of, annex of um, annexation. Make sense to everyone? All right, so the next one is A for Maria, is what? The adaptability the adaptability of the item or um, the for ordinary use. So example, is it being used as real property? Like for instance, um, like a kitchen cabinet, right? Because it's matching used as real property or being used as personal property. So the example they give you is a refrigerator in your book and they say, okay, well, you know, this refrigerator, you know, most refrigerators can basically just be wheeled out, 
And that would be considered really kind of personal property. Everybody likes stainless steel and, you know, blemish free stainless steel these days and all this good stuff. But what if you had a refrigerator installed that had the same facing as the cabinets that you have and it fits in there perfectly and you maybe even put an extra couple pieces of molding around it well wouldn't an a reasonable person believe that that's going to stay like who would think that you're going to take this refrigerator out right so that would be a legal test of that fixture as to whether it should be included during the sale of a property or not. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions on that? Because I really want to make sure you feel comfortable. Okay. Well, the next one for R for Maria is the relationship of the person placing the item on the land. Okay. So the story is, and you know, this is pretty important, um, is that we know that the courts are going to favor a tenant over a landlord almost every time. And the courts are going to almost favor many cases a buyer over a seller because it really kind of is, you know, it really kind of is the um, seller's responsibility to disclose. I mean, it's not really their responsibility, but they should try to make, they should not be kind of like using trickery or, you know, making it look like it's included, but it's not, you know, it really is a seller's best idea to say, hey, this is not included. Just like I told you with the island. Like whether we agree to that whole thing or not, at least they weren't lying. They were being straightforward, you know? So the relationship of the person placing the item is they said, hey, we're taking this with us. And then for I is the intention of the person. You know, well, what did they do, right? Is how were their act, were their actions consistent? Did they put it in there to be temporary or not, right? Was it just something that was just plugged in? Or was it, um, or bolted to the floor? You know, I mean, think about things that you have in your house and how are they installed? I mean, that should kind of tell you the intention. And then lastly for Maria, is the agreement of the parties. And that's where the real estate agent, the real estate agent plays a big role because the real estate agent should be able to say, hey, listen, Mrs. Seller, Mr. Seller, okay, so when we put this on the market, let's disclose that it's included or it's not included. And, you know, to, um, you know, document document it on a um, what we call a an inclusion exclusion list and this list should be given um to be given to the buyers right so does that make sense so does everybody see maria does anybody have any questions about the legal test of a fixture so you have to be somewhat familiar the method of annexation, how permanent was the attachment, A, the adaptability of the item, you know, how, would, how did it adapt to the rest of the property? You know, like for instance, I mean, that island, you would think that it's included because, you know, the method, it looked like it was um, attached to the floor, but I guess she said it was on rollers. The adaptability, it looked like the rest of the cabinets, okay? Um, but the agreement, right, for, for Maria A, the agreement showed on the inclusion exclusion list that it wasn't going to be included. Okay, any questions on that before I kind of move forward? 
All right. So kind of getting back to our little presentation sheet here, you know, this is where it talked about, you know, they, they really don't have Maria the way that they should, but the, the method, the M, the method of annexation, right? The A, the adaptability, right? The R, which they don't have in here, the relationship, because this is a little bit older, the relationship, and then I, intent, and A, agreement. Right. Now there's a special category of fixtures, right? And these are called trade fixtures or a chattel fixture. Now, when we talk about these, basically what we're talking about is something that's used in conducting a business. So think about the word trade, right? Used in conducting a business. So I, um, I originally, well, not originally, but a few minutes ago, I mentioned, okay, you know, we're not talking about tables and chairs as being real property. We're talking about those as being personal property. But if we're talking about tables and chairs and booths in a restaurant, well, those are considered to be trade fixtures. If we're talking about um, the lifts, the hydraulic lifts in an auto repair shop, those are considered to be trade fixtures. Um, if we're talking about chicken coops, you know, on a farm, those are considered to be trade fixtures. Now, the interesting thing about trade fixtures is that they must be removed by tenants Right, they must be removed by tenants um, before the end of the lease, because if they're not and they they are now leave the property, a tenant, and let's just say they have their pro, they have their trade fixtures there, well, they will become if they're not removed, they become the real property of the landlord. So how interesting is that? Right, they become the real property of the landlord, and acquiring the landlord acquiring property in this way is another word for you to remember that will probably be on the state exam is a session a c c e s s i o n. Right, that's called a session. Okay, and that's related to like the legal principle of constructive annexation. So trade fixtures are a little bit different. Remember, they belong to um, the tenant until the tenant, if the tenant was to leave them, then they will belong to the owner of the real estate. Okay, they're usually considered a permanent part of the building, but they could be removable. And if someone was to sell, so let's say I'm, uh, you're renting me out a restaurant, right? And in this restaurant that you're renting me out, um, you're leasing it to me, it has the ovens, it has the counters, you know, the refrigerated, um, the, the refrigerated counters where I'm putting some ice cream in there, and it has um, tables and chairs. Well, if you sell the building, even, and I'm leasing out the restaurant to you. I mean, I'm leasing out the restaurant from you. Well, the new owner of the building will now own those same things that you're renting to me. Okay. Um, so remember, it's kind of interesting as to how those could work. Now, it's different for every single sale. And usually you need a special agreement for that. But in many cases, that's how it works. And what's interesting about that is that, um, you know, you need a special agreement, but when it comes to regular fixtures, they're usually always included in the sale or mortgage. So like, again, regular fixtures like the boiler, the faucets, the lighting systems, any reasonable person will think that that's included and it should be in a regular sale. But when it comes to trade fixtures, right? Those are usually, if I own them as the tenant, then they won't be included. But if you own them as the landlord 
and you have a special agreement, they will be included. So does that make sense to anyone? Who has questions about that? Because we get a little bit tricky. All right, my friends, we've got about 10 more minutes or so kind of getting through this unit. And, and we're going to talk about now the, the different characteristics of, um, of real property, right? So the first one is the economic characteristics, right? And so the way that I remember this is SIPA, S-I-P-A, because again, they're going to have some questions on the state exam. All of the following are economic characteristics of real property, except, and if you don't try to find ways to remember these, you're definitely going to find yourself at a disadvantage, right? So there's four economic characteristics of real property that will affect its value. The first one, scarcity, right? So think about it this way. Yes, we know that there's plenty of land out there. Right. I mean, if you kind of look like, you know, throughout the whole country, like the Midwest, there's there's millions and millions of acres. But why is land, let's just say, in Manhattan or waterfront or waterfront property, you know, along the ocean or lakes? Well, why is it so expensive? Right. Because there's only a finite amount. Right, there's only so much land in Boston, downtown. There's only so much land in Manhattan or Washington, DC, or some very, there's only a finite amount of land available in very desirable areas. Right? So it is scarce in many, in many cases. Man, that word areas looks terrible. A-R-E-A-S, okay? The second economic characteristic is improvements, right? Remember, we're talking about things that affect the value. Well, improvements affect the value. So like, for example, if um, people build, um, you, you basically build a, a nice, um, I don't know, three car garage or like some beautiful shed or like a nice in ground in ground pool those will affect the value of your property okay building an improvement on the property will affect the value the third thing is permanence of investment right so when we talk about permanence we're talking about um, things such as, you know, sewers, right? Or city water. Now, there are some people that they, um, you know, they, they say, well, it's no big deal for me to have a well or a septic, right? It's no big deal. But the truth of the matter is, is that homes that do have a sewer or city water, they are definitely, they're usually worth more or people, they're more desirable. They have a higher value because that's what people want. People want to live usually off of a paved road, right? People want to have city water, city sewer, right? So that would be considered to be an economic characteristic. And then the fourth one is uh, known as area preference or location or situs, right? S-I-T-U-S. So that's a word that you're going to want to remember. And what is that basically saying? That we know it might sound cheesy, but like everybody says, the most important thing about um, a piece of property is location, location, location. There are some properties that people just prefer, you know, prefer certain locations over others. You know, think about, well, why do you like this location over another? And that is area preference. And so that's an economic characteristic. So those are the four economic characteristics of real estate that affect, remember, value. Value. Who has questions about that? 
right? Again, they're going to ask you another question. Okay, um, on the state exam, the following are the physical characteristics of real property. And they're going to put in all kinds of um, answers there and you need to know, IIU. I mean, this one's a little bit harder, I guess, to, to remember. To me, it's kind of easy because I've been doing it for so long, right? But you need to know the three physical characteristics, right? Of, um, of real property, okay? And so if we think about these, the, the first one is immobility, right? Well, what does immobility mean? Well, I know that some of you could say, oh, well, you know, we have dump trucks and I've seen people move houses and that sort of thing, right? But the truth of the matter is, is that even though some land might be removable, the geographic location, geographic location cannot be changed. You know, no matter how much dirt you remove, if you fly over that area with a plane and look down and take a picture, you still have that same parcel of land. That parcel of land cannot be moved. It's fixed. And so that's why it's immobile. And so that's a physical characteristic of land is that it cannot be moved, right? I mean, think about like you're down, you're down um, south and it's a hot 100 degree, degree day and it's been 100 degrees for a month. And then all of a sudden, let's just say the Coca-Cola plant in um, Georgia breaks down. And they're like, oh my gosh, we don't have any more Coca-Cola. Well, they can call up, let's just make it up, the New York bottling plant of Coca-Cola and be like, hey, send us down 20 truckloads of Coca-Cola because we are hot and, and you know we need our Coca-Cola. Well, you see, you can do that with products, but you can't do that with land. You see how land is immobile? You can't say, okay, well, we need a bunch of more land down here in Myrtle Beach. So we need um, Connecticut to send us down 20 um, lots of land. You just can't do that, okay? And then also the land is considered to be indestructible. So yes, we know we talked about um, erosion. We talked about avulsion and that sort of thing. But regardless, no matter what happens, even if there's a sinkhole there, that parcel of land is still indestructible, right? Because the parcel is still going to be there when you drive over it, right? And somebody's still going to have to pay taxes on that parcel, right? Even God forbid um, it's mined or it's eroded, or there's a, a bomb that goes off on there, that parcel is still there. So that's considered to be a physical characteristic of land. And then lastly is the uniqueness, right? So we know, um, you know that we can drive through certain neighborhoods and we see kind of like, you know, have you ever driven through a neighborhood and you're like, oh my gosh, there's, you know, there's 30 houses here. They're all the same. They all look the same, right? But regardless, right, no two parcels are exactly the same or in the exact same location. You know, one parcel might flood, even though they're right next to each other, and maybe they're the same size and everything else. One parcel might flood, the other one might not. One might have ledge and the other one might not. One might have a beautiful view of the sunset and the other one might not. And so you, this uniqueness is also known as non-homogeneity. So that's non-homo-g-e-n-e-i-t-y, okay? That each parcel has its own geographic coordinates right? And each one is totally different. So those are the three physical characteristics of real property. Anybody have any questions on those? All right, my friends. And lastly, just to kind of finish up this unit for today, are the laws affecting real estate? And, you know, th this is pretty simple stuff. And basically what they want you to know 
um, as a real estate agent is that there are quite a few different laws that affect real estate. And they kind of like, um, you know, are, are, all, are all over the place here, but you should be somewhat familiar with these, that you should have an understanding of a lot of these laws and that there's, there's some of, you know, they're really pretty important that we know we can't be an expert, but we, cause we're not attorneys and we shouldn't act as attorneys, but we should be familiar to be able to help out our clients. So the first one is technically contract law. You know, well, what's that all about is that you're basically signing contracts. That's pretty simple. General property law, which we talked about, the bundle of legal rights. And how many are there? Five. And what are they? Well, you should definitely, you know, know them and make sure that you remember them, right? What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about possession, right? We're talking about control. We're talking about enjoyment, exclusion, and disposition. So possession, control, enjoyment, exclusion, and disposition. Agency law is all about, well, what are the relationships between the parties? Relationships between the parties. Real estate licensing laws, Okay, well, knowing that you have to do 60 hours of class and you have to take a final and all that good stuff. The federal re regulations, what are the federal, state, and local tax laws? Like we should be familiar, well, you know, what's it gonna cost me for taxes? And the zoning of the, of the land and the, how you can use the land. You know, is it residential or is it commercial? And then lastly, the federal, state, and local environment regulations. So does anybody have any questions about these different laws and how we should be familiar with them that affect real estate? All right, so that's pretty much our unit on real property and the law. Um, and so, you know, this is something that you want to go through and make sure that you, you know it, you're familiar with it. And you might get right now, the way that it looks is maybe you'll get about eight questions or so on the state exam when it comes to these, um, to these different, um, to this particular unit, real property and the law.